Good afternoon. Welcome to the FTD University webinar titled, Smarter Sales, the Floral Strategies Way. Today you will learn the basic sales concepts that florists around the world have been using since 1997 to increase their average sales by double digits. Tim Huckabee, President of Floral Strategies, will be leading this informative webinar. Once Tim is finished with his presentation, we will open the webinar up for questions. If you have a question, simply type it in that question box on the upper right side of your screen. Please feel free to submit your questions during that presentation, and we'll hold them until the Q&A portion of the webinar. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the call over to Tim to begin the webinar. Tim? All right. Thank you, Janet. And ta-da. So here we are. This is me, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about me first before we get started. I'm really appreciative of FTD inviting me back after last month's webinar to do a follow-up. Uh, for those of you who didn't attend last month, we definitely recommend that you go into the archive and uh, watch that recording. Last month's webinar was based on customer service. This one's going to be based on sales. For those of you who are not familiar with me, um, I own a company called Floral Strategies. And, and basically, I am in a unique position. I'm the only person in the world with my job, well, aside from the people that work for me, what I do is I am an educator in our industry, and I've spent the past 20 years visiting nearly five or over, at this point, 5,000 flower shops all over the world. Jan and I were communicating last week, preparing for this webinar while I was visiting flower shops in England and Ireland. I visited all 50 states. I've worked across Canada, Australia. Basically, what I do is I teach a process that enables any flower shop, regardless of size or location, to engage customers in a new way and to increase their average sale by 20%. And that's a huge amount. No matter whether you're doing $100,000 a year or $10 million a year, 20% increase to your bottom line is, is pretty, um, pretty epic, pretty monumental. So typically what I do and my staff is we will come to the store, spend the day or two days with you and teach this process. A, a complete workshop, top to bottom, takes about three hours. What we're going to do this afternoon is give you basically an overview, some elements of that workshop so that you can begin using these in your store today and see that even on the most basic level, you can move the needle pretty substantially by changing just a couple of uh, ways that you think and a couple of ways that you engage customers. So sit back, take notes, and as Janet said it, at the beginning, um, feel free to ask questions. You can type them in as we go along or at the end. Um, we'll, we'll save some time to, um, to answer those. So I carefully chose elements of my program to, um, to share with you today. And what you see on, on the screen right now is that, that overview. And it might look a little bizarre, but trust me, it'll, it'll, all, it'll all make sense. We're going to begin with some mantras. And these are four mantras that I really look at as the cornerstone of my thinking. And when you embrace these, when you integrate these into the everyday culture at your store, it definitely will have an impact on sales. You will increase the level of customer service. You will have fewer complaints. It really is kind of a win-win for everybody. So the first mantra is ask fewer questions give more advice. And the reason behind this is historically in, in our industry, we ask way, way, way too many questions. All the customer wants to do is come in or call your store, place an order for flowers, but we don't let them. What we do instead is we ask them all these unnecessary questions. And I'll give you some examples because maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, you know, that's I've got to ask them questions. How can I take an order? You don't need to ask as many questions as we ask now. A couple of points. Here's a concrete example. Pretend that a customer comes into your store and she's carrying a clear cube or cylinder vase. She puts it down on the counter and what she says to you is, I'm having a dinner party this weekend and I would love to have this filled with some flowers. And I, I like maybe all um, yellows and oranges, citrusy colors. So here's the old school approach. What we do, albeit with the best intent, is we ask her, um, okay, well, would you like us to do a, um, a leaf wrap in that for you? And unfortunately, you can't see my face right now, but, but the face I usually make is a kind of contorted um, brow and acting like the customer, I think, uh, 
yeah, I, I, I guess so. Meaning, she doesn't know what the heck a leaf wrap is. So you've made her feel uncomfortable, and she's kind of sheepishly saying, sure, yeah, why, why not? Here's a better approach. You're the expert. Give her advice. When she's standing there holding a container that you know is going to be the focal point of her dinner table, tell her what she needs. So instead of asking a question, give her advice, say, well, this is what I'd recommend. Since you're using this as a centerpiece, we can add a leaf wrap. That's where we simply line the inside of the vase with a broad leaf. It hides all the stems. It gives your design a nice finished look. And I absolutely guarantee you her demeanor is going to be very different. At, at that point, she's going to have an ear-to-ear -ear smile and just think, oh, I'm glad that I came to a flower shop instead of grabbing some flowers at the grocery store or ordering them online. I would have known that. This is the advantage of dealing with a professional. Here's another way of gauging this or my making my point on this, and that is over the course of the conversation now, of your typical customer conversation, ask yourself, how many times is a customer saying to me or asking me, well, what do you think or what's your opinion? That's my point. They should not ask that. People who go through my whole training process hardly ever hear this from a customer because our entire engagement is different. It's more focused on guiding the customer and giving them advice instead of asking them a bunch of questions. So basically what I'm asking you to do moving forward is to put your head one step ahead of your mouth and think for yourself, do I really need to ask this as a question? Can I not give it to a customer as a bit of advice? They'll appreciate it and they'll be very, very conscious and aware of it. One of the, the ways that I gauge that is when I'm taking customer calls, what I typically hear at the end of the conversation is a customer coming back and asking me for my name again, even though I gave it at the, at the top. They'll sometimes ask for my name again simply because they want to say, Tim, thank you so much. You made this so quick. You made this so easy. You made this so effortless, meaning they realize unlike every other time they ordered flowers, they didn't have to ask or, pardon me, answer a million questions. You'll notice that these four mantras are somewhat connected. The next one is make shopping easier. That sounds very simple and very, very um, almost pedantic, but it really does have a big impact on customers. And here's my explanation of it. As a consumer, if you think about your favorite retail store, no matter what they sell, clothing, food, shoes, sporting gear, whatever your favorite retail store is, it's not just because of one reason. It's not just because of what they sell. It's because of a combination of things. It's the way that they, they merchandise them, the way that they, they price the products. It's maybe their customer service policy. It's the demeanor of the staff. It's the way that the store is lit, the way that the store smells, the parking, the ease of um, access to the store, how close it is to where you work or where you live. All of these things combined make it easy for you to shop there. So what happens is you as a customer shop there more often. You give them more of your money. So that retail store has the last lap. They spend time and energy making it easier for you to shop there, and you do it. And you're more inclined to recommend that store to family and friends and coworkers. You need to think about that in your store as well and on two different levels. Number one, I don't know when was the last time that you entered your flower shop through the front door. Literally look at your store through a customer's eyes. And I mentioned that I visited, I visited 5,000 flower shops. And I continue to visit about 200 flower shops a year. There are times when I walk in and I'm just astonished because the rug is like so dirty, I expect to see like a chalk outline of a body on there. Or I'll grab something off the shelf and there, there are no prices. Or the cooler is half empty. That's not making it easy for me to shop there. To the contrary, it may, it's making it easier making it easier for me to think about maybe I can get flowers elsewhere. So make it easy for your customers physically to shop in your store. And what we're going to touch on today are things that you can say and do to make the telephone shopping experience easier. If it's easier, they're going to spend more. If it's easier, they're going to come back. If it's easier, they're going to say good things about you on social media. If it's easier, they're going to be more inclined to recommend you to people. And that just means more sales. Third mantra, huge, and it, but it's simple. Don't be afraid to hear no, meaning when I'm teaching this workshop on site at a shop, 
I'll ask everybody, before I even tell them this mantra, if I were a customer, you didn't recognize me, if I walked in the front door, if I called here and I said, I want to send some flowers to my daughter for her birthday next week, how many of you, upon hearing just that, not knowing my history or anything else, would start me at $100 or higher? And, and, I'll, and I'll change that, that dollar amount depending on where the store is, but basically I gauge a little bit out of everybody's comfort zone. And then inevitably, probably 95% of the staff kind of sit there sheepishly looking down at the floor, thinking to themselves, don't call on me, don't call on me. And I'll ask them, you know, I'll pry it out of them, why won't you, why won't you start me there? And what they'll say is, well, you know, that's, that's too much, and she's only a teenager and all these reasons. My counterpoint is, what's the worst thing I can say? And when people stop and think about it, they realize that the worst thing I can say is no. No, I don't want to spend that much. Give me some other options. No, I don't like that choice. Give me a lower price point. No, I don't want to spend that kind of money. Give me another design. In our industry, we foolishly or mistakenly think that if we offer a customer a higher price point, that somehow he or she is going to slam down the phone and never call us back or storm out of the store insulted. And I'm not saying that this doesn't happen. It happens typically at Valentine's Day. It can happen periodically throughout the year. But we often are our own worst enemies, that we're not making the bigger sales and, and bagging the, big, the bigger orders because we're not letting customers spend the amount of money that they want to spend. So take that away from this conversation. Think about it in your store in terms of your pricing. But what's the worst thing the customer can say? It's no, don't fear it. And finally, my last mantra is that you should never, ever, 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 ever apologize for prices. Only educate customers instead. The floral industry is very weird because we're the only industry, as far as, far as I know, on the entire planet that actually apologizes for doing our job. Think about it. Customers come in, they ask you for a price on an item, and you tell them the price, and they have kind of a, a maybe caustic reaction. And what do we do? We apologize. Oh, I'm really sorry. That's crazy. When was the last time a car dealership apologized for prices? McDonald's apologized for a price. Starbucks apologized for a price. Jewelry store apologized for a price. Only florists do. And every time we apologize, we perpetuate that myth and that stereotype that we're overcharging, that we're a ripoff, that you're really better off buying flowers online or at a grocery store. If I am in a situation where I've made a mistake and maybe we promised a customer a particular color and we didn't deliver that, we delivered on the wrong date, whenever I make a mistake, I will take ownership of it instantly and apologize to a customer. But when a customer perhaps points at a peony and asks me, how much is that? And I say, well, they're, uh, they're $10 a stem, and they freak out. I'm not going to say, oh, I'm really sorry. What I'll do is I'll say, yeah, aren't they gorgeous? Right now, they're out of season. We're actually importing these from South America, or they're being grown in a hot house in Alaska, or they're coming in from New Zealand. That's why they're at a premium. Then the customer understands why we're charging what we're, what we're charging. But I, I refuse to apologize, and you should too. And this doesn't mean that you can't be a caring and engaging customer service salesperson, but remember, when you apologize for uh, your prices, you're undermining your value. You're, you're demeaning the whole industry. So that really is something that, that needs, needs to change. Again, I encourage all of you to review these mantras, talk about them as a team, integrate them, into the culture in your store. Now I'm going to give you a little further insight and help you to better understand what actually happens when customers call, when customers visit. I've got probably about half a dozen cartoons that I've integrated into my training because when I've, when I've collected these over the years and seen them, they put a smile on my face, not just because of the caption, I think we can all relate to this caption, but because of the, uh, of the strong message that, that this sends. So take a look at this uh, cartoon and understand what's going on there. This, this guy, this customer, did something rotten. Um, we don't know what it is. You can fill in the blanks how, how major or how minor you want it to be. But he did something rotten. And thankfully, his train of thought was on his way to work that he was going to stop in the flower shop, order some flowers, and kind of make everything right in the world again. And that's kind of where we're meeting him. If we could pull back the camera 
I imagine that what we'd see is a flower shop that has a lot going on. It's probably a very full cooler. There may be candles on display, chocolates, lots of plants. I mean, as you can see, he's already kind of surrounded by all these options. But the interesting thing from my perspective is he's not seeing any of it. He's not paying attention at all. All he's doing is looking at her. He's kind of staring into her eyes as he's telling her his sad story, telling her basically whatever th this faux pas was that he, that he committed. Look at his, um, his body language for a minute. It's, it's pretty interesting. He's, he's hunched over, and, and I think it's not because of his guilt. I think it's because he's just uncomfortable standing in a flower shop. He doesn't know what he's, what he's looking at. He doesn't know what these things are all about. His hands are also telling a story. His right hand is stretched out asking for help. His left hand is buried deep in his, in his pocket digging for his wallet. And he's going to give her whatever she is asking him for. Right now, she only has one job. And when I'm training on site, I ask people, you know, what do you, what do you think her job is? And I get all kinds of responses from, you know, they can pay for what he did or sell him or comfort him or give him options or give him choices. And technically, all of those have some play in it. But really, her only job is to listen. And ironically, it's the thing that we do the worst in the floral industry, in my professional opinion. We tend to hear customers, but we don't listen to customers. And that might sound like the same thing, but it really isn't. There, there's a huge difference between the two. Hearing is what happens on the most cursory level. Listening is what professionals do. Listening is when we just slow down, we really comprehend what the customer is saying, and make a, a, a bigger assessment. We make a professional uh, judgment in, on, on their behalf as to what is best suited to their needs. So let me give you the, the difference between the two. If she were to simply hear him, what she hears is, Here's a guy in trouble, he wants to send some flowers. And maybe there's a $65 arrangement sitting in the cooler, so she points to it, she goes and grabs it, and he looks at it and thinks, yeah, that's pretty. And he either takes it with him or he gives the, the woman the, the details on the delivery and has it delivered. Technically, there's nothing wrong with that. It's probably a pretty arrangement. Maybe it would make his wife happy. But I think there's a missed opportunity because if he did something really horrible, and I'm going to let your imagination run wild on that as to what he did. But if he did something really horrible, I don't know that a $65 arrangement is necessarily appropriate. I think something more along the lines of $100 or $150 would, would be better. But he, here's where I'm, where I'm going to invoke those, those mantras. If she offered him a $150 arrangement, the worst thing that he could say is no. But this is what would go through his head, is he would think to himself some version of, yeah, she's probably right. I probably should be spending that kind of money, but uh, you know, I just I don't want to splash that much today, or splash out that much today. So his response to her would be, "Well, I don't want to spend 150, but can we maybe do something for 100." So stop, think about it. If he spends 100, that's $35 more than that $65 arrangement. That means more money for the flower shop. It means more flowers for his wife, and it's kind of raising, raising the bar. So there are three facts I want to present to you, and I, and I know these are facts because I continue to take orders myself. Over the course of the year when I'm working at a busy flower shop at a holiday like I'll be doing in a couple weeks for Mother's Day, I'm taking orders. So I'm constantly talking to, to the public. I understand how their shopping patterns are evolving. I understand the kind of help that they want, and I understand how they typically um, typically act. So the first fact that I present to you is that most customers don't know what they want. This guy walked into the flower shop just with a general idea, I need flowers. Beyond that, he didn't know specifics. The second fact is that people are looking at us as the expert. When you look at this woman behind the counter, can any of you tell me, I know you can't, but can anybody guesstimate how long she's worked there? We don't know. It could be two weeks, two months, two years, two decades. Guess what? He doesn't know. Guess what? He doesn't care. By virtue of the fact that she's on the other side of the counter or that she answered the phone, she instantly became the expert in his eyes. The third fact is probably the most fun, and that is that customers will buy what you tell them to buy. He's going to buy a $65 arrangement if she tells him to. 
he's going to buy a hundred and fifty dollar range in if he if she tells him to. We have that much sway over customers. We just don't realize it because we get all hung up in what we would personally spend. Our kind of um, ridiculous feeling of like, oh, if I offer the customer something too big, I'm going to scare her away, or I'm going to insult her, or she can't afford it, or he can't afford it. They're going to buy what we tell them to buy. And I've got a way of proving that to you. Every flower shop that I've visited for the past 15 years since the, the internet has become a major player in our, in our world, when you look at your, your web sales, they inevitably always outstrip the sales that are that are taken on the floor or on the phone. And these are the same customers. What's the difference? On the web, left to their own devices, customers can choose the higher price points. They can they can buy the, the bigger designs, they can they can tick the boxes and buy the balloons and the stuffed animals and they spend more. So customers will buy more. We're just not letting them. But all of that should be starting to change after today. Now on that thought, I'm going to continue this, the my sales education and take you into a restaurant. And I've long held the belief that the restaurant business and the flower business are first cousins. And if you, if you think about the commonality, both industries are dealing with a perishable product. Both industries are dealing with a visual product. The difference is the restaurant business does a fantastic job of selling their visual product, their perishable product, the floor industry doesn't. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to copy them. We're going to learn from them. We're going to, like it says at the top, sell flowers like food. So let me give you the, um, the setup on, on this cartoon. Think about this restaurant as being local to, um, to your shop. It's, it's down the street. And the customer comes in tonight and he sits down and he looks at the menu. What he sees on the menu is a list of all the usual items. So there's, there's chicken breast, there's meatloaf, there's lasagna, there's maybe a chicken pot pie. And they all cost about maybe $18, $19, $20. So when the waiter comes to the table, he recognizes this customer. He may not recognize his name, but he recognizes that this guy comes in regularly and he typically um, orders lasagna. And tonight, when the waiter approaches the table, he's you know, prepared to write up the, the guy's order for lasagna as he's done in the past. But the customer asks this question. So he kind of throws the waiter a curveball. Like with the previous cartoon, I'm going to give you two different ways that the waiter could respond. One would be that he hears the customer, and the other would be that he listens to the customer. So if he hears the customer, what he hears is, the guy just wants something different. And I think the way that he could respond is he could tell him, for example, well, you know, the, the meatloaf is pretty good. I actually had it for lunch myself. And I think unless the customer is a vegetarian, he's going to say, yeah, sure, why not? Because think about it from a money standpoint. It's a lateral move. He's moved from one um, item, one entree at $18 or $19 to another. So it's not terribly adventurous, but he is trying something new. There's technically nothing wrong with that. The, the customer might leave a big fan of the meatloaf, and now he's got two reasons to come back to this restaurant. But there's a missed opportunity, and that's what I want to present to you. So here, here's the second version of it. The waiter approaches the table. The customer asks that same question. But now what the waiter does is he jumps right in and enthusiastically tells the customer, I'm so glad you asked because we just started carrying lobster. And these are huge. They're about two pounds each. We're flying them in every day directly from Portland, Maine. We serve them with locally sourced dairy butter and these three wonderful side dishes. And that lobster dinner is $80. I wish I could ask all of you, what would you do? Would you, would you buy it or would you, would you not? But I'll, I'll, I'll answer for you. Basically, the customer is going to say yes or no. The customer might volunteer, ooh, you know what? I'm not a big lobster fan. The customer might say, you know, I just don't want to spend that much. The customer might say, I'm not going to spend that much on myself, but next month when I come back with the wife, I'll, I'll get it. But the customer might say, yeah, you know what? I grew up in New England. I haven't had great lobster in forever. Do it. Get inside the waiter's head. Think about what happened. He didn't sit there in hem and haw and do what we do in the floral industry and think, oh, gosh, this guy's always ordered lasagna. He's always spent $20, and I'm really afraid if I offer him something at $80 that he's going to be offended. Or, oh, he's so old, and he's on a fixed income. 
it's, it's ridiculous the way we talk ourselves out of bigger sales. The waiter went right in there, offered his customer an item four times what he normally spends because he knows on one hand he might jump at the opportunity and have this great experience, but he also knows that there's a pretty strong likelihood or it's pretty unlikely rather that the customer is going to say, how dare you offer me that $80 entree and slam down his menu and tell him I'm going to Sonic or Burger King and walk out the door. It's just not going to happen. There's some lessons to be learned. Here are the three facts. Number one, your customers want new and different. Take a look in your cooler. Is it 2017 or is it 1997? Week after week, month after month, I walk into flower shops and I ask myself that question, not necessarily just because of the design. Some of that's a little behind the times, but the price points. I see this, this what I call a sea of safe prices. The white wicker baskets at $49.99. Maybe the, the cube range at $69.99. Where is the $100, $150, $175 range then? You all do it at Valentine's Day. You probably do it at Mother's Day. But guess what? There are 50 other weeks out of the year. Your customers want new and different. Because if you don't give it to them, they're going to find it somewhere else. Secondly, and these all kind of dovetail, people want to spend more than you think. I so enjoy opening my emails every week and hearing from, from shops that I, where I just trained or my staff just trained, where the owners are just flabbergasted. Oh my gosh, we implemented your process and our sales have skyrocketed 20%, 25%. And I'll tell you a dirty secret. It's not that I've turned their staff into great salespeople. It's just that I've unleashed their staff. I've empowered them to listen better and give customers the chance to spend the money that they want to spend. Your customers will do the same thing. So what it comes down to is you've got to sell flowers like food. Meaning, when the waiter approached the table and the customer asked what's going to change my life, the waiter didn't act like a florist and say, oh, we could do something delicious for you, 50, 60, 70 and up. It's silly. It's laughable. How, how can we just sell a price point to a customer? What the waiter did was this beautiful presentation where he gave his customer a layered description. So much so, but by the time he got to the $80 price tag, if the guy really loved lobster, he didn't care how much it cost. He was going to order it anyway. I teach people how to sell flowers like food. It's smarter, it's quicker, it's easier, it's more productive. And you can do it too. Paint a picture, put a price tag at the end. It's got to be the last thing that the customer hears. Okay, in my first mantra, I mentioned that we're asking way, way, way too many questions. And I gave you the general concept. But now I'm going to drill it down a little bit further. I'm going to give you specific questions that you should never, ever, ever ask a customer. They're, they're a waste of time, and they just they kind of make you lose your, your footing and your position, position as the expert. And some of you probably will gasp when you hear some of these. Maybe we'll get into some frisky verbal debate at the end, but um, this is just the way, it's the way we roll at Floral Strategies. Number one most ridiculous question to ask customers. There are six, actually, six that when you ask these questions, you ruin a sale. You insult a customer, you ruin a sale, you diminish your standing as the expert. My number one question is, what's the occasion? Who cares? It's a ridiculous waste of time. Who cares what the occasion is? And I'll show you. And obviously, I need to know and I want to know and all of us need to know. Is this for a funeral or is this for a birthday? That goes without saying. But let me give you an example of how you ruin the sale. Customer calls the store and he says, I want to place an order. Great, I can help you. Um, what's the occasion? It's, um, it's my wife's birthday. Okay. And, and here's what I do. I'm looking into my cooler and I see we've got some beautiful yellow roses. So I say to him, well, I've got some beautiful yellow roses. How about we send her a dozen of those in a vase and that's 75 bucks? What is he likely to say? He's likely to say yes. Why? Because of the dynamics of that first cartoon. He picked up the phone with the idea of just ordering flowers. Who answered the phone? The expert. I told him what to buy, and he bought it. So I go on to tell him, great, she's going to love these. Give me some information. What's your wife's name? Where are we going to find her? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, what would you like to say on the card message? Card message comes, and he says, dear Kathy, happy 40th birthday. Can't wait for our trip to Brazil. All my love, Michael. I can't truly say what, I, what I'd be thinking, but I will give you the G-rated version, and it's something along the lines of, darn it, 
I just sold this guy a $75 order and he just gave me a $250 card message. Here's the point. Whether you're using Mercury Technology or another brand, whether you're taking an order even on paper, doesn't matter. You've got to take the card message before the product. It's the most intelligent, engaging, conversational way of dealing with the customer. So let's revisit that. If I follow my own principle, if I didn't ask him what's the occasion, if I took the card message and then I reacted to that and said, wow, 40th birthday, that's such a milestone. I've got gorgeous yellow roses. Let's create a special arrangement for your wife. I can design 40 of those in a, in a, in a crystal keepsake vase that'd be priced, I don't know, $300. What's the worst thing he can say? No. The best thing he can say is yes. But even if he doesn't want to spend that money, he might come back and say, well, you know, these tickets cost me a fortune. I can't spend that much. But um, yeah, you're right. I probably should do something a little bit above me on what I normally do. Well, let's can we do something for like 150 Absolutely. I just doubled the sale. Not being a salesperson, but being a good listener. Not asking silly questions, giving advice. All right. On our rogues list of hateful questions, number two. Oops, sorry. You get it. Number two. Oh, this is so ridiculous. Remember my mantras, make shopping easier. If you tell the average customer that you've got scabiosa, I'm telling you, they're going to wonder, well, is it contagious? Does, does, it, does it hurt? It's so ridiculous that we ask customers, what flowers would you like in the arrangement? They don't know what flowers they want. And you make your job twice as difficult because they turn around, they ask you for flowers you don't have, and now you're running to your wholesaler, you're paying a premium for that one bunch of flowers. Let's say it's iris. You get them in, they look like bullets, you can't even use them. You maybe, you know, through witchcraft and hot water and telepathy, you force a couple of them open, and then you throw away the rest of the bunch. The problem with our industry is we're, we're upside down. We're letting sales drive design, and it should be the, the reverse. It should be the design. What you have in the cooler, that's what drives sales. Sell what you have. Sell a color scheme. Talk to them in a language they understand. Just for the record, and this will kind of give me away if I ever test call your store, when people ask me that question, I immediately say, Lily of the Valley. And then you can hear this big gasp. You can hear their throat closing up. And then what happens? Then they have to say, oh, sorry, we don't have that. And then I say, well, you asked me what flowers I want. I thought you could get any flowers. You're a florist. You know, Lily of the Valley is my wife's favorite flower. Oh, I guess I need to call another flower shop. And they're like, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. We set ourselves up for failure. Talk about colors. Talk in a language they understand. Make shopping easier. Okay. There's another question. And everybody always thinks this is going to be the first one. But I decided just to shake it up and make it number three. So the third of the six horrible questions you can never ask a customer is, how much do you want to spend? Why? It's rude and it's ignorant. There's no other industry on the planet that insults customers this way. And yes, when you ask customers how much you want to spend, you're insulting them. You're the expert. Your job is to listen to them. Your job is to make an assessment and your job is to offer them an item that's appropriate to their needs. Match it up with what you learned from the card message. I'll put it into context. A customer calls your store because something emotional happened to him or her. Somebody in their life was just married or buried or died or divorced or promoted. That's all that they're thinking about, just this general idea of flowers. And when you turn around and ask them, and how much you want to spend, or what's your budget, it's like you just slap them across the face because this is what happens. And we've all been there. Suddenly there's, an, there's a change in the customer's voice. It literally drops an octave or two because you're, you're asking them a question that they never get asked. They're never asked this at the deli when they go to buy a new couch, when they're looking at earrings, when they're choosing a new car, when they're buying sneakers. But you've asked them this question that's just bizarre and weird, and, and they respond by saying, I, I don't know, is, is, is $50 enough? And now you're locked in to $50. I cannot express enough how ignorant, how rude, how horrible it is to ask this question. So I'm beating you up a little bit to make my point. I've only got you for a short time. I really want you to walk away from this webinar thinking, ooh, yeah, he's right. You know, we've been saying and doing that for years, but is it the right way to, do, to operate? And it's not. 
Just think about your life as a consumer. Where do you go that you're asked how much you want to spend? Do they ask you that at a restaurant? Do they ask you that at the dentist? No, it doesn't make sense. Upon hearing this, people always come back to me, kind of sheepishly say, well then, how do we find out what the customer wants to spend? Your job is to listen. Your job is, after you find out where it's going and why it's going, if the customer hasn't volunteered a price point or an item, your job is to ask them. Do you have something in mind or would you like a suggestion? Have you picked out an arrangement from our website? Would you like to hear about our specials? Or would you like me to tell you about an item that we're featuring this week? Give them a chance to solicit your, your opinion and your feedback. Make an appropriate suggestion. You're the expert, guide them. So there's three of my top six questions. What I also want you to understand is that by not asking these questions, you are skinnying down your time on the phone. My average call time is two and a half, three minutes at most. And I'll tell you at the end exactly how I do that. But, but by and large, it's because I'm not wasting my time or the customer's time asking questions that don't need to be asked. So go back and rethink how you're engaging customers. Or even turn the tables and think, how would you want to be? Um, dealt with as a customer. And I really highly doubt anybody listening to this webinar would want to be asked by a clerk in any retail capacity, hey, you, how much money you got in your pocket? How much money you want to give me? It's rude. Stop doing it. Okay. On a lighter note, we're going to talk about selling finishing touches. And that is floral strategies speak for additional items. Balloons, candy, teddy bears, candles, basically add-ons. So we get back to the idea of mantras and what I find is that when a shop has a culture of selling these, it's typically presented as a question. We ask the customer, do you want anything else? Do you want to add anything to your order? My response is yes, curly fries. Or we ask the customer, do you want to add a balloon? That's a yes, no question. And you're kind of breaking my mantra because you're not making it easy for them to make that decision. You're not telling them what kind of balloon it is. You're not giving them the price. I've got a smarter, better way of doing it. And here's my outline. I sell finishing touches. So as soon as I'm done selling my main item to the customer, whether it's a, a plan or it's a vase arrangement, I will then come back and, and, and I, let me stop. Let me rewind for a minute. As I'm selling the main item, what I'm always thinking is, what can I pair with this? What would be a good complement to this? And then I'll come back to the customer and say, as a finishing touch, point number one, that's kind of a bridge between the main item and the second item. And then I tell them, we can include or we can add a box of chocolates, a happy birthday balloon, um, a scented candle, whatever you feel is appropriate. And then I price it out and I tell them, it's just five dollars. It's only ten dollars. They're only twenty dollars. And then the customer is going to say yes or customer is going to say no. As you see at the bottom, another great option is just take a greeting card and offer to handwrite their special message and a keepsake greeting card. That's perfect for, for funerals. Again, even as we sit on this webinar, there are customers on your website ordering and ticking all these boxes and ordering all of these um, choosing all of these items. So they're proving my point that they want to buy this. Unfortunately, we end up profiling customers. Well, he seemed like she was in a hurry, or I didn't want to seem pushy, and I didn't think he wanted to spend that. I do this rhythmically, systematically, consistently. As soon as I offer you your main item, I come back right away and say, oh, and as a finishing touch, I can attach this, I can attach that. The interesting thing is customers are forever saying to me, oh, thank you so much, or I forgot about that, or, oh, that's great, she loves balloons. They thank me for letting me spend more money because really what I'm doing is I'm simply helping them or allowing them to personalize their sale. It's pretty interesting the, um, the response that, that, I, that I get. And make it, um, make it fun, make it an integral part of your sales process. Uh, people will, will ask me, kind of tongue-in-cheek, well, am I going to sell a funeral balloon? No, you're not going to sell a funeral balloon. However, if you offer, um, if, you, if customers have the option 
of going with a, a scripted ribbon, this is a perfect time to, um, to talk to them about that. And I'll say, as a finishing touch, we can um, personalize your funeral flowers with a scripted ribbon that says beloved grandmother, um, best friend, whatever. But this is definitely something to, to focus on because this is found money. If, if you remember years ago when McDonald's implemented their plan where they were supersizing their fries, they increased their global sales by 15%. So think about that for a minute. 15% to a company like McDonald's was millions and millions and millions of dollars. And that was simply by reminding customers, oh, for an extra whatever it was, 35 cents, you can supersize your fries. But people did it. So I would approach this two ways. One is on the phone, definitely offer this to every single customer. The, the only time, let me back up, the only time that I don't offer this is if somebody's calling from a company perhaps and they've got a purchase order, they've got a set amount, typically most flower shops want to sell flowers before they want to sell balloons because there's a, a higher margin in, in flowers and flowers are perishable. But for every other customer, offer it. And when you've got that customer who's being really, really tough on you and beating you up about prices, of, you know, who's complaining about delivery and huffing and puffing through the, every item that you mention, you know that if you offer him a balloon at 50 cents, he's still going to say it's way too much money. You can opt out of that. But basically for every other customer, I offer a finishing touch. To that end, when you're taking that critical look at your store and you're thinking about how can we make shopping easier, think about having some of these readily available at the counter for your walk-in customers. And don't be so cavalier as to think that just because you've got some balloons blown up that customers are going to see those and automatically buy them. You still have to have that conversation. Whether you turn or you grab one and say to the customer, as a finishing touch, I can attach or I can include a happy birthday balloon or get well soon balloon. Make them available. They'll buy them. It's kind of a win-win for everybody. Okay. I am going to move on to a little bit of bonus material. And we, we specifically yeah, left a little bit extra time today because this whole topic today of sales, I think, lends itself to lots of questions. I know that there were people that were emailing questions into Janet even before the webinar launched, and hopefully those of you on the session today will have a couple of questions. But I do want to go over um, one additional item, and it's Denny's. It's the power of the Grand Slam breakfast. And <clears throat> I'll explain. Years ago, I was working in a flower shop in Kentucky. And I was there for the day, as I typically am. And part of the process is when I'm at a store, I don't want to just teach and preach. I want to show you how well it works. Because I think what I fight against sometimes is people say, well, you know, you're from New York and here in you know blah blah blah, you know, that's not going to work. And it does. Over the course of the day, I took maybe a dozen orders at the store. At the end of the day, a designer came up to me. He'd been there for about 20 years. And he said, I just want to say thank you for, for taking all those orders. I just I can't believe they did everything you said they would do. They spent the money. They bought the balloons. They gave you the email addresses. Um, you're like the customer service whisperer. And I, I smile. I said, well, you know, thank you for the compliment. Really, all that I did was what I taught you. I used all the tools everything that we discussed, and I implemented it. Now, now, granted, I teach it all the time, so I'm smooth with it, but it wasn't like I've got some special reserve version of my training. I literally practiced what I preached. On my way back to the airport, I kept thinking about it, and I realized that there was something fundamentally different that I was doing. And the best way for me to explain that to you is through Denny's, meaning when I'm talking to a customer, I make a conscious effort to slow myself down and talk to them in the same manner and pace and tone as though I were sitting across the table from a friend on a Saturday morning at Denny's having a Grand Slam breakfast. So think about it this way. Put yourself in a customer's mindset right now. If you called my, my store and you said you want to send flowers to a close friend for a birthday, here's what I'd say to you. Well, this is what I recommend. Let's send your friend one of our beautiful large vase arrangements. That would be the perfect size for her to place in the middle of the dining room table. We're going to fill that with beautiful garden flowers in all different shades of pink just for her. 
and those are priced between 100 to 125 dollars. And the customer is going to say yes or no, and there's a technique for for settling the price. But basically, the way that that conversation could go is I could almost say it's almost as though you can imagine me saying leaning over and saying, and by the way, you're going to finish that bacon. In other words, I talk to the customer in a relaxed way. I don't know why we as an industry are so afraid of customers. I train people who have been doing this for 10 or 20 or 30 years, and they still sound scared. It's like I could see their blood pressure rise. I see the, the, the veins throbbing inside the side of their neck when they're talking to customers. Why are we so afraid of customers? If you embrace these mantras and understand that the worst thing that they can say is no, you take it in stride. You don't take it personally. Oh, that's fine. Instead of the large design, let's stick with that beautiful yellow or pink palette, whatever you discussed. We'll send them the medium size instead. And then I go on to describe that, and I give them a price range. But if we're comfortable and we're, we're relaxed, customers pick up on that. And that is, by and large, why this gentleman gave me that compliment, because he heard customers just happily spending money, agreeing to my suggestions, thanking me at the end, because I literally set the tone. I kind of brought them down a notch. I made them feel comfortable. And when you do that, they respond. They respond by spending more. They respond by thanking you. They respond by coming back and being repeat and loyal customers. Okay, so I've hopefully filled your head with lots of new ideas and new perspectives, but I do want to take a minute and answer any questions. See if people have questions that they've either typed in um, or some of the questions that came in before the webinar. So, Janet, I'm going to circle back to you and see what you got. Fantastic. Thanks, Tim. We want to thank you for sharing a lot of great information. Um, as Tim mentioned, we're open for questions. So if you have a question, type it in that question box on the upper right side of the screen. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. Um, Hank was asking about, what about his staff who doesn't want to come across as pushy? Well, my, my response to that is, I'm with you. I mean, I, I hate to sell. I hate to be sold. And I truly believe that this complete process of which you got a flavor today is based upon just listening better and making the appropriate suggestion to customer. Really, we're acting like a curator, if you will, or an interpreter between the customer and the designer. And as long as you, you don't take it personally when a customer says no, we end up making bigger and better sales. And I've got, you know, 20 years and thousands of customers to back that up. So you need to have a conversation with customers and uh, pardon me with your staff and also remind everybody that your customers are coming to you. They're picking up the phone and dialing you. They're walking in the door. We're not cold calling. We're not grabbing people off the off the sidewalk. The, it's them coming to us and it's our job to just engage them and offer what we deem to be appropriate. Fantastic. Um, Lisa said she's afraid that she's going to chase customers away if she uses some of these techniques. Do you have any suggestions or thoughts about that? The only way that this won't work is if you don't do it. Um, si simply put, I don't want to sound too big for my britches, but you know, I've helped florists make millions and millions and millions of dollars doing this. Interestingly, what happens when people use this complete process in addition to seeing their average sale skyrocket, they see their complaints drop dramatically because a customer has a far better understanding of what they're getting for their money. There, there's more alignment between their expectations and what's actually delivered on, on their behalf. And maybe if the culture at your store for a long time has been our range and start at, our range and start at, and asking customers how much you want to spend, there's going to be a learning curve where you're going from being very passive to now being proactive and making suggestions. But you're going to be paid back in spades, both with the increased sales and the, the admiration and the accolades from customers. Contrary to that fear that you're expressing, customers really appreciate being handled this way. And they'll, they'll show you with their kind words, their comments on social media, and with their pocketbooks. All right, we've got a question from Bob. How do we handle a customer that wants $200 arrangement but wants to only spend 75 They have suggested a smaller size, but then they say that they're expensive. Well, 
the, the analogy I draw all the time is, you know, cars. You can't go into a Mercedes dealership and say, I want a Mercedes, but I only want to spend, you know, I want a 2017 Mercedes, but I only want to spend $10,000. You know, they either call security or, you know, give you directions to the nearest Hyundai dealership. It's part of our job just to put on our big boy pants and explain to a customer, hey, you've got great taste. That design is $200. If you can, if you need to keep to a $75 budget, say, wonderful. Let me show you what we can create for $75. And I was just talking about this very topic to the group that I'm training here in Michigan today. You might have to come back and visit a couple times. Don't be afraid to say to a customer, and again, for $75, here is what we can create. And if you like that larger design, that's $200. Maybe they didn't hear you the first time, or maybe they think that they can wear you down. But it's not fair to the last you know, dozen or so customers who spent $200 for a $200 range that this customer should somehow get a discount. We're afraid, again, of engaging a customer, We're afraid of hearing no, and maybe if the customer is being adamant and obstinate, you know, you, you just you say to them, as much as I'd love to help you today, as much as I want to be able to sell you flowers, I simply can't give you a $200 range for $75. Here are your options for $75, and I hope we can you know, find one that, that meets, your, meets your expectations. I don't, I don't know why that's so difficult for us to do. It really, it really baffles me, but that's what you need to do. Have a candid conversation with the customer. All right. Just a reminder to everyone, if you have a question, type it in that question box on the upper right side of your screen. We'll be sure to share them with uh, Tim. Uh, we also have a question from Jack. Um, he doesn't think he can sell the higher price points because customers can get those flowers from the grocery store that's right across the street. Do you have any suggestions as far as that? Yeah, ignore it. You know, they're, they're not your customers. If they're so focused on price, then, you know, then let them shop there. What, what all of us here at some point or another is this kind of dismissive, borderline, abusive commentary for a customer like, oh, I saw that in the grocery store for, you know, for $20. You know that they, they didn't see your design in the grocery store. You're using Pincushion Protea, and the arrangement in the grocery store has Alstroemeria. Here's what I say to the customer. Even when they're, when they're antagonist, antagonistic to me, I say to them, I honestly don't know what the grocery store carries, what the quality is, and what their pricing is like, but I'm glad that you chose to visit us, and if you don't want to spend $75 today, let me show you what some options are at $30 and $40. In other words, remind the customer <laughs> they're not in the grocery store, they're in your store, and that's part of a tactic that people use, but we can't succumb to it, and that gets back to my mantra, don't apologize for your prices. The beauty of a flower shop is that we can offer a customer an item anywhere from $10, $10 to $10,000. Very few businesses have that kind of a spectrum of, spectrum of price ranges. So remind your customer of that. What else, Janet? Oh, it looks like that's all I, oh wait. Um, Bob has a follow-up. He said, it's very difficult to be upfront with customers as we're afraid of the social media aspect. Sometimes they say upfront that we're gonna post it on Yelp or Google. Well, you know, we can't, we can't operate a business under the guise of what if, what if, what if. And as long as you're doing right by the customer, if they go and they put on some incendiary or blasphemous comment, then you need to go, go on and, and refute it. But if a customer is demanding a $300 arrangement but only wants to spend $75 and threatening to, to go on to Yelp, then, you know, you just have to say, you need to do what you need to do. I mean, I, I just I, I don't think we should operate from a standpoint of being intimidated, threatened by customers. But if the customer said, well, if you don't give this to me, I'm going to go on Yelp and tell people, say, well, I, I really hope you'll tell them the truth. I'm trying to accommodate you. I simply cannot give you a $300 arrangement for $75. And, and maybe draw an analogy. Say, I don't know that you can go into Banana Republic and demand that they sell you a $100 sweater for $25. They need to make a profit. You know, we're in business to make a profit. I can work with any budget, but I can't give you a $300 arrangement for $75. That's all there is to it. We just, we seem so afraid to, to take a stance and say that to a customer, but we need to. All right. Tim, do you want to go to the last slide so this has your for email sure. address up there? Yep. That way. So. Bob, Bob says thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. So here's some contact information. 
I would encourage you to, um, to reach out to me if you have further questions about we talk, what we talked about today. Likewise, um, as an FTD member, you are entitled to special rates on my training to bring me into your store to learn the entire program beyond just the sample that we got today. So there's my direct email address, there's my phone number to the office, and then we are recording this and putting all this online so you can go back and watch this again with your staff, download the materials. Right, Janet? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Tim. I appreciate that. Um, it does look like we are out of questions for today. So as Tim just mentioned, um, that yeah, if you missed a portion of this, if you want to share it again, you want to have a um, a whole staff meeting and, and then the staff gets to watch it and discuss it, that's great. Um, we will have it available at FTD University online uh, later this week and a PDF of the presentation is available on ftdi.com in the uh, webinar materials section. Um, and as always, we will be sending a very brief survey to gather your feedback on today's webinar. We'd ask you to please take a minute or two and complete the survey, help us improve our future webinar schedules and other education programs that we're offering to the membership. Um, the next FTD webinar titled Seven Trends in Social Media and How to Take Advantage of Them is scheduled for Tuesday, June 20th. Kristen Naher, CEO of Bootcamp Digital, will share the biggest social media trends impacting your business and how you can take advantage of them. The registration is already available at ftdi.com, so be sure to register as soon as possible to reserve your spot. And uh, we just want to thank you again, Tim, for sharing a lot of great information on how to increase our average sales. This concludes FTD's webinar, Smarter Sales, the Floral Strategies Way. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Good night.